Hi, everybody. It's Stefan Molyneux from Free Domain Radio. Hope you're doing well. We have Ingrid Karlqvist. She is a journalist and author based in Sweden. She is a distinguished senior fellow of the Gatestone Institute and editor-in-chief of Dispatch International. Ingrid, thank you so much for your time today. Oh, thank you, Stefan. I'm so happy to be here. So nice to sort of touch in once in a while with the giant social experiments going on in Europe. Uh, I think as it's been pointed out, Swedish parliament about 1975 said, hey, enough of this mono Swedish culture. Let's go full tilt multicultural. Uh, and um, I guess, you know, let's uh, check in a couple of decades later. How's the experiment going? <laughs> you know, I've been thinking about this so many times and I can't just I really can't understand why they did it. Why did our parliament take this decision? I'm pretty sure they didn't know what they decided. I mean, Swedes have for a long time been known that we are very generous, we are very kind people. And, uh, you know, this was in the years of Olof Palme, the social democratic prime minister we had. And he was all about uh, international solidarity. Sweden is such a good country. We're so rich. We can help all the poor people in, in the world. And this was, this was just one thing, you know, saying, oh, the Swedish thing is not so important. Let's just be a multicultural country instead. But I'm pretty sure they didn't know what the consequences would be. And I know for a fact that the Swedish people, they didn't even know that they took this decision. And um, there does seem to be, of course, there is a, a phase when uh, particularly a government program goes badly. There's a phase of covering up the problem, of ignoring the problem, and of attacking anyone who dares to point out basic mm -hmm. facts. Where is Sweden in the process of denial versus finally just resigning itself to accepting facts these days? I think what has happened the last year or so is that the Swedish people are finally waking up. I mean, nobody can escape the consequences nowadays. Now we have asylum houses in all the cities, all the small villages. Everybody has them close up. So, you know, people are scared. They are scared of getting raped. They are scared of getting mugged. They know that the property, the, the value of their properties will sink if there is an asylum house as a next door neighbor. And people are really, really scared. I, I think that we are sort of over the phase where you could you could scare people more by naming them as racist than scaring them with with reality. I think that most Swedes now, they, are, they have finally woken up and they say, what have you done to our country? We believed you when you said there were not going to be so many foreigners. I mean, Sweden was always going to be a Swedish country. Now we are facing the fact that Sweden is not really a Swedish country anymore. It is on the surface, but so many things have changed. And if you had told me 20 years ago that this was going to happen, this is the country where I would live in, I wouldn't have believed you. I would have laughed at you because we all thought that oh, we can cope. There are not so many. They will become Swedes just like we, and we can be one big happy family. That's what I thought. Well, of course, a lot of people have thought that, and uh, the British uh, intellectual who coined the term Islamophobia has just recently come out and said, I was completely wrong. It was a complete mistake. They're not integrating. And just so people outside of Sweden could uh, get a sense of the scope of the problem. So this year, 190,000 unskilled and unemployed migrants are expected to come into Sweden. That's 2% of the entire population. So that is the equivalent of 6 6.4 million penniless migrants who don't speak English arriving in the U.S. in one year, 6.4 million or 1.3 million in Britain relative to the population. Yeah, it's absolutely crazy. I mean, last year we had 163,000 and then the government uh, realized that this was too much, too many, too quickly. So that's why they decided to have border controls and ID controls. So Actually, if you want to seek asylum in Sweden now, you have to be able to show a passport or a driver's license or something like that. Otherwise, well, wise, you will not put your, your feet on Swedish soil. You will be stopped in Denmark. And that has actually cut the numbers. From uh, last year, there were some weeks we had 10,000 of asylum seekers in one week. And now it's down to five or 600 every week. 
And then they decided that when they made this law about border controls, because you're not supposed to have border controls in the EU, you know, but you can always do what you want to do if you are just brave enough to do it. And our government actually was. I don't think it's because they're brave, it's because they understood that if they didn't do anything, they would be, you know, pushed out of the government and, and there would be a great uh, collapse of the system. So, um, but when they decided about this law, it was only for six months. And then you had this, this, this gap for two weeks before you could have another law. So everybody was now, you know, deadly scared that during those two weeks, in the middle of July, we would be flooded again. And the Sweden Democrats, who are the only party, you know, opposing this, uh, this uh, mass immigration, they have been going on for, for four months now saying, we cannot have this gap, you have to do another law. And they say, no, you're racist, no, you're... And then suddenly yesterday they decided, why? It's not a good thing with a gap for two weeks. And now they decided we will not have a gap. Oh, so the gap, so because the border controls six months at a time, according to Swedish law, but the two week waiting period for the controls to be reinstated, that has been cast aside and that window yeah. has closed? Yeah, suddenly it was all uh, possible to do that. And here is where we release the doves of happiness, <laughs> yes, there is some relief from this. Um, now, as far, like, w w I sort of wanted to get, you said you don't know why. I think there are some sort of reasons why this general mindset has taken hold in Europe, which we can talk on a little bit later. But um, let's talk a little bit about the crime, because this is the truly shocking stuff. And it, of course, crime is more than just the numbers that has occurred, right? So we can say, oh, violent crime up by over 300% rapes by almost 1500% have increased. But crime, of course, affects far more than just the victims and their families. Crime um, brings a mindset into mm -hmm. people who have not really thought about, like women not really be concerned about being out at night uh, in the past, uh, feeling safe and secure in their own society. There is a sort of um, bunker mentality or a cocooning mentality that occurs when you have spikes in unmanageable crime, particularly when you don't feel, as I think a lot of Swedish people don't feel, and rightly so, that the police are going to be very helpful. Mm. So what has taken hold of the mindset as a result of these massive escalations in crime coming from the migrants? Well, especially for women, the rape statistics are, you know, we are so scared. And I grew up in, I was born in 1960. So I grew up, I was a teenager in the 1970s. And, you know, that was the best period of all, I think, because, you know, we could go, we could go out, we could go with guys and we could do whatever we wanted to. And if I went home with a guy and I suddenly changed my mind, I could just tell him, sorry, I don't want to have sex. Uh, bye bye. And he said, OK, a bit sad, but you know. obviously he had not been informed about his patriarchal powers of the race no. culture. No. That's a shame. No. That's a good good <laughs> yeah. for him and good for good for Sweden. Yeah. But, you know, the, the, the problem with this is that we still sort of, the politicians and the feminists, they still live in this era. So they tell the girls, you can do anything you like. No one can rape you. You can go if you want to. You can walk naked through the, the streets of, our, of your city and nobody can rape you. So these young girls, they actually believe that this is a fact. So they go home with a Somali guy to have some tea in the middle of the night and then say, oh, sorry, I changed my mind. I don't want sex. And she will get raped because nobody's telling these girls who are the rapists in Sweden. You know, there are some fanciful uh, explanations about why we suddenly have this 1500% um, increase of rapes. Uh, they say it's because um, women are more brave these days. Could be something about this, you know, that they actually go to report it to the police. But uh, I don't think that Swedish women are more brave than Danish or Norwegian women. And they don't have the, the rape rates that we do. And then they say it's because we changed the law. So rape is not only rape nowadays. It could be touching or something like that. But I study a lot of these rape vic uh, verdicts, you know. And I know that these are not the rapes. They cannot explain the increase and, but the most wonderful of all the, the explanations is that Swedish men, they, are, they have been so crushed by, by the feminists. So this is their last, you know, 
their last way of showing who is in charge. They rape their women. Yeah, it's so oh. crazy. You wouldn't believe it, but this is actually true. This is what they've been telling women. And there is this feminist myth that the most dangerous place for a woman is her own home and her own bed. That is actually not true. The uh, Crime Statistics Authority, they just said a few years ago that 60% of the rapists are totally unknown to the woman and only 13% are committed by her boyfriend or her husband. So that's just a fat lie. Well, it, it does seem that those of us who are in possession of the facts uh, feel that we're facing some kind of uh, supernatural religious mindset when it comes to trying to get facts. It's like these two opposing magnets, just trying to get facts and indoctrinated people together is, is like this massive titanic effort of will. And even if they two touch and there's a tiny spark when you turn around, it's gone again and they're back to their propaganda. Yeah, and you know... I have been trying for so many years now to get through to people with facts and statistics and studies and, you know, but people just don't listen to facts. So I've come to the conclusion that we have to start talking about feelings. That is what the left have been doing for so long. You know, you have to feel sorry for these immigrants, sorry for them because they're fleeing from war. And when I, came, when I come out and say they are not fleeing from war, more than half of them are not from Syria. They are not fleeing from a war. They come here because they want a better life. And you can blame them, but I mean, it's not very fair that Swedish people have to pay tax for people from other countries to come and live off our taxes. So I have been starting to talk now about how does it feel to not be able to walk the streets of your own hometown without being very scared or being raped or being mugged or being beaten up? How does it feel to see all these women in hijab, all these men in long beard and pajamas walking the streets like they're, you know, they, this is kind of a uniform telling all of us, you are kuffar, you're, you are the non-believers, you are below us. It might be your country, but we are the new rulers. How does that make you feel? How does it feel that your old mother and father, they can't live off their pensions anymore? I mean, Sweden used to be this great country, a welfare state. Now we have older people, they are so poor, they can't buy food for themselves. And the money, who, who is getting the money? All the asylum seekers. How does it feel that your kid doesn't learn to speak proper Swedish in school? Because the school is filled with immigrants. Every week there come new immigrants from Arab-speaking countries. And I've heard so many children, you know, they don't even speak proper Swedish. They speak like they were immigrants because that's a tough thing to do. If You, you don't want to be a Svenne, as they call us, Swedish people. Svenne, that's sort of, you know, you are, you are a Swedish stupid person. And I think that you, you got to do this. You got to ask people, how does it feel not belonging to your own country anymore? Yeah, and I've also used the approach of uh, asking people who are just pro-migrant beyond any sense and reason, how many uh, rapes are you willing to accept in order to feel good about your moral posturing? Is yeah. it 500 rapes? Is it 1,000 rapes? Is it 5,000 rapes? How many rapes is enough for you to question the moral virtues of your inclusiveness? And there has to be some number because it's certainly more than zero, you know, and it's into the hundreds, if not into the thousands, if not into the tens of thousands across Europe. How many women are you willing to look in the eye and say, yes, you should be raped because I want to feel good about not being a racist? Yeah. Yeah. And, but I mean, what can you do when even the feminists, they talk about, this is not about immigration. This is not about Islam. This is not about the Muslim way of looking at non-Muslim women. It's about men. Men rape, period. Men are to blame. And it doesn't matter what you say, because they are so, they know, they have decided that the white man is the enemy. So they don't care if the white man is so nice, he never rapes, he's very equal, he doesn't mind uh, having a woman as a boss. Swedish men are so nice, you know, really so nice. But they're being beaten up all the time by these feminists. And the feminists, they, are, they must be prepared to, to be raped themselves, I guess. 
You, you have well, seen all these pictures, you know, with blonde, blue-eyed women standing with signs saying, refugees, welcome. And if you are a Muslim man and you have, you know, you are so sure that men are above women, Muslims are above non-Muslims, Muhammad took sex slaves, Muhammad was a perfect person, so I'm entitled to sex slaves. And they come to this country and they see all these women standing with signs, refugee welcome. It's like an invitation to rape. They want us. That's what they think. Well, and... Um one argument could be made that if, if we white males are such terrible rapists, we should keep the migrants out of the country so that they're not exposed to our terrible rapey ways. You know, they, they really should, should stay uh, elsewhere or go to other places in the Middle East. Well, be, they'll be safer from the terrible white male patriarchy. We want to keep them, you know, if, if the poor little lambs are wandering into the lion cage, we should keep them out so that they don't get destroyed. Mm. But, you know, people don't know about these uh, things. People don't know the first thing about Islam. And as it's forbidden in Sweden to keep statistics on what religion the criminal has, so there, is, there are no statistics. There are some studies that was made, the last one was made 10 years ago, because then they saw that immigrants are so overrepresented in Especially, especially violent crimes and rapes. So they decided not to do any more studies about this. But if you go to these studies that were made in uh, 2005 and so on, you can see from which country they are if they're not Swedish citizens. Because if they're citizens, you cannot see it. But if they're not Swedish citizens, you can see that men from Iraq, for example, they rape 22 times as often as Swedish men do. So there you have there you have it. You can actually know that Muslims are the ones who are committing most of the rapes. We know it also because we are not allowed to keep statistics on religion in, in uh, prisons. But a few years ago, there were these, uh, this news coming out that they needed more imams in prison. Why do they need more imams in prison? Well, because there are so many Muslims in the prisons. The idea that people can claim that they didn't know as much about Islam as they should, I find to be entirely sophistical. Because if you say to the average European woman, hey, let's go live in Saudi Arabia, what do you think she would say? Even if she'd never studied anything, even if she'd never read any of the hadiths or mm -hmm. knew nothing about the Quran, nothing about the life of Muhammad, what would she say? She would say, no, I won't go to that horrible country. Well, then, <laughs> if you move enough people from the Middle East to Europe, you get... A slightly more temperate Middle East. I mean, this is this I, the idea. Well, I haven't studied enough of Islam. Just look at your gut sense. Hey, let's go live in Qatar. Let's go live where? Like, I mean, this is not where Western women wake up dreaming. This is why there aren't hordes of migrants of Western women clamoring to get into Iran. No, but you know, um, I don't know about the rest of Europe, but in Sweden, it's like this. The politicians and the journalists and the do-gooders, they believe that everyone who comes to Sweden from an Islam country, they are fleeing from Islam or they're fleeing from a horrible dictator who doesn't understand Islam, who is, you know, they have kidnapped Islam and making a, a horrible thing out of this actually very peaceful and loving religion. So when people don't want to know the facts, how can you force them? We, you, you can, I think, by, by talking about feelings. And, you know, I have been comparing the Swedish situation with the mass immigration to a forced marriage. You know, the Swedes are the woman, the girl who is forced to marry someone she doesn't like. She doesn't love him. He's horrible. He's raping her. He's beating her up every day. And when you go to the parents to complain, the government, and say, I don't want to be in this marriage anymore, they say, oh, you are a horrible person. You are a racist. You must stay and be more nice to this husband. Then maybe he will stop beating you and raping you. And I think that is something that people understand. They can see the metaphor. They can see, yeah, it's really like a forced marriage. Nobody asked us, do you want this? Do you want your country to change from a Swedish country to a multicultural country? No, people would have said, no, never, no way. If it ain't broke, don't fix it, as the old saying yeah. goes. 
Now, what are the, just for the edification of the, I guess, hundreds of thousands or more of people who are going to end up listening to this, Ingrid, what are the aspects of uh, Islamic thinking or theology that you feel are, or you believe, are the least compatible with Western values that a lot of people may be unaware of? Well, of course, it's the, the main problem is that you cannot, Islam is not compatible with democracy. Islam is not a religion. I, I say that Islam is a totalitarian ideology. Why do I say that? Well, because it's not just a, a matter of faith, you know, praying in your house and having a relationship to God. Islam is a complete system. You have the Sharia law. You have, you have no uh, distinction between uh, politics and religion. They're all the same. And you have rules for everything in a person's life, even which foot you must step into the toilet with. I don't mean that all Muslims follow all the rules, but that is what you are supposed to do to be a good Muslim. And Sweden is, according to the, you know, the World Value Survey... Sweden is the most secular country in the world, the most individualized country. And you mustn't, uh, you mustn't think that that means that we are all strong individuals. That is not. We are, the state are looking upon us as individuals. It's never a family. It's never a couple. If you are poor, you need money. They can't say to you, well, your husband has a lot of money because you are an individual. So that's the Swedish way. We are, we are, the state looks at us as separate individuals and we are very secular. We don't believe in God anymore. And I think the reason for that, this is quite new actually for me to be thinking like this. I think that, you know, the Vikings and they believed in the Aesirs, the Nordic mythology with Thor and Odin and all these gods they were not like gods you actually prayed to. They were more like like better persons. and they Like were superheroes. Superheroes, yeah, exactly. They were brave. They were righteous. Some of them were quite, um, you know, devious. And you should not be like Luke, for example. He was, he was kind of bad. But Thor and Odin and Frigg, um, the wife of uh, Odin, uh, they were... They were superheroes. And uh, he, I sort of view them as, as models for virtues that were considered necessary for sustaining society. Yeah. yeah, and they were quite equal. You know, the goddesses and the gods, they were quite equal. So when the Vikings had a very equal society, there were even uh, women, you know, going on the raids with the men if, if they were strong enough and, and bold enough. And um, what happened was that when Christianity came to Sweden, they sent the women down in the cellar again. So, but basically, I think we are still like the Vikings. We still, we still look up to the things that these Nordic gods did. We want to be true. We want to be honest. We want to be hardworking. And we don't really believe in mystery gods, you know, that you pray to. And if you are very, very good, God will give you some things. I think that we still are these people that we believe in superheroes. And we try to, to be good as they were. So um, the Church of Sweden was a very, very strong power for many years. You couldn't actually leave the church until in the 1950s. And when it was possible to leave the church, a lot of Swedes did. And they still, you know, they go to church for weddings and for, for uh, christening their children and so on. But the church doesn't play a part in the Swedish life. And then suddenly... But we don't want to be, you know, unpolite to people. So if someone is religious and you want to pray to God, we say, fine, go, go on, go on. But you, you, you pray in your house and that's fine with me. You don't have to talk about, it. you don't want to run around with a Bible in your hand all the time. And then suddenly comes a lot of people who are really religious. They want to show it in their clothes, in their beard, in their hijabs and everything. And Swedes get, you know, a, a bit, uh, what are we going to do with this? And we don't want to be rude to people, so we say, okay, oh, you need halal food? Okay, okay, fine, we can eat anything, doesn't matter. Oh, you don't want pork? Okay, okay. Oh, you don't want to, to, to be um, swimming together, men and, and, and women? Okay, okay. So we do all these things and, and we get back, you know, now we are in the corner. 
And suddenly religion has taken a, a big place in the Swedish society. But people still don't understand why, because we don't have our own religion, sort of. I mean, this with the, with the ancient gods is something I just found out a couple of weeks ago. And I, it's, you know, it just struck something inside of me. Yes, this is my history. This is my legacy. This is where I belong. And I think if more Swedes... Uh, could could you know discover all these old uh, ancient gods? We would be happier, and we wouldn't have a, a sense of self, you know, knowing who we are, because the Swedes are now very very confused. Well, yeah, I certainly think that uh, obviously, if Islam ends up taking over Europe, it would be the second time a Middle Eastern religion has taken over Europe, and I yeah. don't think that in Europe there is enough of a countervailing. And I hate to use the word faith because I'm sort of a rational and empirical philosophy guy, but a belief system strong enough to match the faith of the people coming in. Uh, and that is something that Europe is sorely lacking. In other words, and I was talking to a, another um, journalist from, from Europe recently who was saying that the lack of a larger belief system uh, in Europe has allowed for some great progress. However, it has also left a giant crack in the wall of mm -hmm. European uh, identity and nationalism and, um, you know, Islam and other aggressive ideologies. And I've always pointed out that uh, um, it, Islam is to religion as communism is to economics. You, you can't mistake the communism as sort of world dominating ideology that passes itself off as economics. And I would also argue Islam is in that similar category. But there is a lack of um, faith, belief, trust, respect and a treasuring of European history. Of course, Europeans have been told by the leftists for decades, you know, imperialists and, and uh, racists and sexists. And there's, I think Europe has been in a verbally re abusive relationship with its intellectuals for a couple of decades. And I think that there's just not enough treasure left in the heart of the European mind to really value and fight for intellectually the values that Europe represents. I, I think so too. I think that's very true. And that's why, you know, anti-racism and um, being kind to refugees has become sort of almost a religion for some people. Because there is this giant hole, as you say, and we need to fill it with something. Because people need a sense of self. Who are we? Where have we come from? What is our thing? And if you have been told so many times, as the Swedes have been from our politicians, that there are no such thing as a Swedish culture... All good things have come from abroad, and uh, all that Sweden ever gave uh, the world is barbarianism. Talking about the Vikings, I guess, who were not yeah. not so much more barbaric than than the rest of the people in that days. They were just smarter. <laughs> that was the white the Vikings, and and I think that that's why I believe that the Swedes need to, you know reconquer the Nordic mythology because I think that that is the answer I think there we it's it's I heard so many people when we have been talking about this in the podcast uh, that we have every day and there's so many people you know writing to us saying wow I, I almost started to cry when I heard this because it's 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 like there is a collective um mindset you know that there are things even if you've never read about it in school never heard about it you know for a fact this is us this is our country this is what we believe in well i i certainly jung has this idea of the collective unconscious and i certainly think that mythologies develop organically with the biological evolution of particular ethnicities and you're never that far from the myths that were woven into your evolution as a culture and as a, a, a being uh, and as a race and so on. So that doesn't surprise me that there are certain affinities. But there is, I think, this, I mean, we can talk a little bit about the causes because without accurately identifying the causes, it's very hard to come up with any kind of solution. And there is a general perception that comes from the left, which is that all wealth is appropriated, all wealth is stolen, all wealth is the result of exploitation. And there is, in general, this idea that Europe is rich, not as the result of free market, not as the result of the Greco-Roman uh, tradition, not as the result of Adam Smith, not as the result of uh, Ricardo and all the economists who fought for limited government and free trade, and not as a result of uh, European culture and history, uh, to some degree, of course, the Judeo-Christian view. So Europe is not rich because of its commitment to freedom and trade. Europe is rich because it's stole from everyone else. 
And that belief, of course, that, you know, if I steal your bicycle, well, you can climb over my fence to take it back because I only have a bicycle because I stole it from you. There is this idea on the left that there is this zero-sum game. All wealth is fixed. And if some people have more, it's because other people have left. And that has less, less, sorry. And that idea has, I think, so become woven into people's thinking that it's hard for them to say, well, the people from Africa shouldn't come to Europe. Because there is this sense, well, we only have all our lovely stuff because we stole it from the people in Africa or we mm -hmm. stole it from other places. So we are as little justified as getting upset at someone climbing over the wall to steal their bicycle back. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's absolutely true. And, um, but, you know, it's so, it's so crazy because if you look at Africa, for example, uh, the only period when they started to bloom, when they started to have industries and some wealth, was when, when, when the West colonized Africa. They took a giant leap, you know, from, from living in the Stone Ages. They, they took this giant leap because of the Europeans coming there and exploiting. Yeah, some of them became very rich, but they also brought some very good stuff to these African countries. But I think that that's, I don't know, if you can't even educate people about the, the unfairness of uh, uh, Swedes working, paying very high taxes just to give them away to other people from other countries. How can you, how can you ever make them understand such a, well, it's not a complicated matter, I wouldn't say, but when you have been brainwashed all your life thinking that we don't deserve this, this is actually what many Swedish people think. They say, I was so lucky to be born in Sweden. I took the, you know, the, the biggest, um, uh, win in the lottery of life. But that's not true. You were born in Sweden because your ancestors were from Sweden and they fought and they hard worked and they did everything to make this country so good. And you think that you have the right to give all that away that all our ancestors, you know, fought for and died for. And we, we have a generation now that believe that they can give everything away. We have a generation of politicians who believe that they are entitled to change the whole system of a country, change the whole country in one generation. So now we have to wait for another two years before there is an election. Or if we are lucky, maybe there will be a new election this year or next year because the government is doing really bad. Well, and another thing which I think people don't understand is not just the demographics of decline versus growth of European versus migrant populations. Just, I mean, the birth rate is, is clear. And the reality is if you take in 100,000 migrants, Sweden is not Sweden plus 100,000 migrants. You know how you have a little bit of cake and then you put some icing on it. And it's the same mm. cake. It's just got a little bit of icing on it. There is a displacement that occurs with these populations because what happens is when the migrants come in, the taxes have to go through the roof to pay because they don't, they don't have jobs. Um, you know, two thirds of the people coming out of Syria going into places in Europe are illiterate in their own language, in their own language, let alone, yeah. you know, and I mean, German is a tough language to learn, even if you're smart. I know I'm half German and took a shot at it, and uh, it's not uh, it's not easy to learn. And uh, if there's no cultural affinity, and you can go into your own ghetto and continue to function without economic integration because of welfare and so on, but it is a displacement because for every migrant that comes in, the taxes go up to the point where one Swedish couple decides to have either no children or one less child because they cannot afford it, and so it is not. Sweden plus 100,000. It's Sweden minus 100,000 Swedes plus 100,000 migrants. And then when those migrants have two or three or four or five or six or more children, in the future, it's going to be Sweden down to a birth rate of Japanese levels, like 0 0.9, 1.0, 1 1.1, because the taxes are all going to be pouring from the Swedes to the migrants, which allows them to have more children, and you have fewer Swedes. It is not Sweden plus migrants. It is minus Sweden plus migrants. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And that is what we are beginning to see now. I mean, exactly as you say, Swedes, they hesitate to have more children than two. Uh, some only have one. And that is also because of feminism, telling women that first you should have your um, education and then you must have your career and then you must choose from a lot of men till you find the perfect one and then you're 40 and you will only be able to have one child. 
And, you know, there, and the politicians have been telling us for so many years that we need the migrants. It's not only that we must be a humanitarian superpower and being the nicest country in the world. We need them because we don't have enough children. I mean, that is so stupid. You could make people have so many more children just by telling girls, don't wait until you're 40. Have your children when you are between 20 and 30. And then you can have your career after that if you still want it and you can get extra extra money for each child that you get i mean hungary they they have started a, a new family policy i don't know so much about it i just know that if you have um, one child you will have one third of a house for free you will just pay for two thirds and when you have three children the house is yours yet there are so many things you can do to stimulate people having more children but i think that um and, and as you say, when we had a normal migration to Sweden, I mean, from European countries and maybe five or 10,000 every year, they integrated. They, they learned how to speak Swedish and they got jobs and they wanted to, to work and pay tax and so on. And nobody thought after one generation, you couldn't tell them uh, f from, from any other thing than that they had different surnames. And so the big difference is the Muslim immigration because it's in their religion. They are not to take Christians or Jews or, or people who believe in Nordic mythology as friends. They want them. They don't want them to speak Swedish. They want them to live in ghettos where they all speak Arabic and they never get Swedish friends. They never go to work in a Swedish workplace because then they will all have to listen to the imam and do what he tells them. And he tells them to have a lot of children so that they can take over the country. Well, there was, uh, I think in your articles, which, you know, it's very, very important that, that people read your articles. We'll put a link to them, of course, attached to this uh, conversation. But there was um, a, a survey done recently that this, the, the Muslims uh, are, are living very, very isolated, separate lives. There's a giant moat of uh, cultural differences between their capacity to interact with, with Swedes and the future of any potential integration. Yeah, of course. And, you know, we, we have uh, some Muslims who have uh, converted to Christianity and they are out telling people all these things. They um, don't, don't, I mean, sweets are again, we are so gullible. We believe that people always tell the truth because that's how we've been raised. That's one of the virtues of the old Nordic gods uh, to always speak the truth. And they... When journalists ask the imams, do you want to integrate? They say, oh, of course we want to integrate. If Sweden was not so racist, if you were not so infested with the Islamophobia, then all our children would be so happy. They would be just like Swedes and they would contribute and blah, blah, blah. And then they turn their back and they say in Arabic to their own people, stupid, stupid Swedes. Don't work, don't integrate, don't pay taxes, don't live as the Kufars because they are not clean. Well, and of course, uh, it is an old tactic that was actually taught to the Mujahideen in the 1980s by the CIA to um, drain the resources of a host country until you destabilize its government. And, and the other thing, too, which people don't understand is that in a lot of Islamic teachings, it is perfectly acceptable to lie to your enemy. It's considered a good thing. Uh, so Absolutely. the universal values of Europeans are wonderful, uh, and I think that uh, integration is, is perfectly great, but people have to share at least some of the basic values. And uh, Western, Westerners are kind of unique in developing universal moral values, whereas almost, other, almost all other cultures in society have very strong in-group preferences and very strong out-group hostility and don't really comprehend the idea of universal Values Like there's no value which says in, in, in the West, well, tell the truth unless it's not convenient to your long term geopolitical aims. And then you can lie all you want. We have sort of a commitment to truth. Um, mm -hmm. But that's not the same in other cultures and mistaking the world for Europe and thinking, well, they're just like us, but just grew up in a different place. There's no basis for that in, in biology. There's no basis for that in culture. There's no basis for that in history. And there's no basis for that in the empirical evidence of how countries run by other groups actually work. 
No, of course not. But how can you convince people when they have been told for such a long time that if you say the things that you just did, Stefan, you are a racist, a bigot, an Islamophobe and all the bad things in the book. You're probably even a Nazi. Do you think that we have something special? Yes. Are you saying that? Yes, white yes, people? I do. <laughs> I really, really do. Because I can. I, I grew up a Christian. I left the Christian church. And nobody came after me, no. right? I mean, they came after me with cookies saying, would you like some cookies? Come back and talk. But they, <laughs> I mean, but Islam, of course, uh, if you leave, and there are several countries, uh, I think close to about a 10, 10 countries uh, run by uh, Sharia law, where if you leave Islam, the, the penalty is death. And then that's what it says in, in, in the uh, Quran. Yeah. So it's not Islamophobia, it's behetophobia. It's I, <laughs> I wish to live a life of my own conscience, my own philosophical explorations without fearing to leave my house because uh, I may be arrested and, and put to death. Uh, so yes, the, I mean, there is this horrible thing that people do when, when they freedoms have been hard, fo hard, hard fought for, hard bled for, and hard died for. Once the bodies have all rotted away and everyone has all of this beautiful greenery that is growing up from the bones and blood of their ancestors, they just take it for granted. Like freedoms are just going to be here, like physics, like sunrise, mm -hmm. like it's, it's, there's nothing we need to do to defend them. That's completely false. The world is a dangerous place and there are lots of bad people who would like to take away your freedoms for their own fun, profit, and edification. And the idea that this is just going to run on its own no matter how many delusions we swallow, uh, is it literally a potentially civilization ending yeah. misconception. Yeah, it is. And I, I sometimes when I have a bad day, I think that it's already, Sweden is already lost because there are such a big um, part of our population that are now uh, from foreign countries. And I think that we now have approximately 1 million Muslims in this country. That is also forbidden. You cannot, you cannot uh, have statistics on that because that would be racist, of course. And, but um, we did in Dispatch International, we did a few years ago, we counted uh, first names. And since Muslims have very special first names, Muhammad and Ahmed and Ali and all of those, uh, we came to the uh, conclusion that in 2012, there were almost 600,000 Muslims living in Sweden. And since then, we have had uh, approximately 300,000 new asylum seekers. Not all of them are allowed to stay here, but many of them, they stay anyway. Most of them stay anyway, illegally. And so we are close to 1 million Muslims in this country. And our the total population of Sweden is 9.5 million. So we have reached the 10%, and I'm sure you have read um, Peter Hammond's um, book, and when he says when there are uh, sort of 1% to 2% Muslims in a country, everybody sees them as a peaceful minority. They don't, uh, you know, demand things. They just live their own lives. And when they are 5%, they start, you know, uh, they want halal food, they want separate uh, times in the swimming pools, and so on and so on. And at 10%, you have the riots, you have the burning cars in the ghettos, and you have more, more militant um, forces. And that's what we are experiencing in Sweden. But if you, as I have been doing now for several months, I will, this is, will be my next big story in Gatestone. I can tell you a little bit about it. We have been phoning a lot of politicians in Sweden, asking them, is Islam compatible with democracy? And you get two different answers. Uh, half of them say, absolutely. No, why shouldn't it be compatible with democracy? That was the most stupid thing I ever heard. And the other reaction is, uh, don't ask me. I'm not the right person. Please don't ask me. And they hang up. So they are scared. People are scared. They would never admit it. But even the politicians in our parliament, they are deadly scared of Islam. And they haven't got a clue what to do about it. They just, you know, it has to be compatible with democracy. Because if it's not, what will happen to Sweden when we have one million Muslims here? Well, if it's not, of course, then decisions are going to be made that might be rather challenging, to, to put it mildly. Now, let's, let's talk a little bit about feminism, and we, we touched on this, and, and I've talked a lot about this topic over the years, and to sort of, para I don't want to speak for all men, of course, right, but, but to sort of paraphrase 
what, uh, what I'm hearing, uh, I'm sort of hearing something like this. Men saying, I'd be happy to save Europe. I just don't want to save feminists too. So if the feminists can be confronted, then I'm happy to save Europe in whatever form that takes, it takes. But right now, I don't want to save Europe because the feminists uh, have just been treating me so badly for the past decades, telling me what a horrible, rape-based, patriarchal, evil monster I am, um, unless I'm not white, in which case apparently I'm some sort of eternal moral hero. But... The challenge of, of feminism, I think, stands as a barrier between the masculine energy that is needed to deal with these kinds of problems and that the actual manifestation of that energy. Intellectually, we all hope it's going to be an intellectual battle and not a pitched battle. But the feminism stands in the way. And I don't think that men can deal with feminism because the female in-group preference is so high that if a man attacks a feminist, that seems to be this coven circle that, that sort of comes up around her. What do you think can be done with the challenge of feminism? Because, um, you know, men have historically stepped up to save civilization when threatened. But right now, there is a reluctance, I think, on the part of a lot of men uh, because um, they will feel that they will be working to save their enemies from the consequences of their enemies' own misconceptions and hostilities. Okay. Um, it, is, it is understandable. I can understand the feelings of these men. But come on, guys. Shape up. You have to save Europe. And when you do, you will also crush feminism because the women, they will be so, so thankful and grateful to you for saving Europe, for saving their opportunities of being women, of being equal, but not feminist. And so they will not be feminists anymore. It's up to you guys. You got to save Europe for us. And if leave the feminists to me, I will deal with them. <laughs> I, I'm not going to ask how, because I'm just going to let my imagination play that that uh, scenario uh, out. Now, you've, you've written about some specific crimes, and uh, it is always my concern when dealing with abstract numbers that we forget about the sort of face-to-face, -face, sweat on the pavement, blood uh, in the gutter, human cost of some of this. I wonder if you would mind going over some of the crimes that you've investigated in more detail that have been committed by migrants to try and put a human face on this looming disaster. Yeah, one of the big things that has been going on now for um, a year or so is the uh, sexual attacks in the public swimming pools. You know, men and women have been swimming together for at least a hundred years in Sweden. It was quite of a scandal, you know, in the beginning of the uh, 20th century. Uh, there were pictures all over the world. Even the emperor of Germany came to this little place called Mölle to see these men and women in their striped bathing suits swimming together in the sea. Uh, so this has been a tradition for a long time. And we even have a lot of nudist um, uh, beaches in Sweden. Uh, people think that's quite normal and uh, natural and healthy. And it's not such a big thing. Uh, but now suddenly uh, we have all these demands of separate times in the public swimming pools. And I think that if we don't get to the root of this, maybe even the Swiss would want to have separate times for men and women. Because what we've been experiencing is especially these so-called unaccompanied refugee children. They come from Afghanistan, almost all of them. Uh, last year, we had uh, 35,000 of these so-called children coming to Sweden. Just a few years ago, there were a, a couple of hundreds coming. But if you give it, if you say to, I mean, 37-year-old uh, guys, okay, little Mohammed, you are 17. Okay, you want to be 17? I write you, you are 17. And then that means you are fast-tracked, uh, through the, the um, asylum system and you get to to live in a place where you have um, people who attend to your care 24 hours a day. You get special treatment and uh, you can even go to school, you know, if you want to, to go out with uh, Swedish teenage girls. It's a paradise, isn't it? If you are 30 or 35 and from Afghanistan, you can just take whatever you want. And a lot of these, I mean, Afghanistan is one of the most dangerous countries in the world for women. Women are treated worse than cattle, worse than dogs and cats. 
And so these men, they come to Sweden and all the politicians think that as soon as they come to Sweden, they will be equal like the Swedish guys. So, uh, but they know that they are, they are not so easy to, to handle these Afghani men. So they want them to have some um, fun in their leisure time. So they give them a free car to the public swimming pool. And what's been going on there? Girls have been raped. They have been groped at. They are called whores. They, they take off their bikini trousers. And, you know, it's, it's, it's come to the point where women won't go to the public swimming pools anymore because it's, it's disgusting. You don't want to go there. And, and these guys, they always come. They don't go one by one. They come in gangs of 10 or 20. It, it really makes you scared. Right. And you had also talked about um, a, some of the faked attacks. Because there is this um, concern uh, at the moment from the leftist politicians that there is going to be a swing in Europe, and it does seem to be happening towards what are laughably called far-right parties. You know, yeah. like, like everybody who wants to control immigration from incompatible or hostile cultures with a stated goal to overtake the country is somehow Nazi, a complete Nazi. <laughs> and, and the idea that you would call someone far-right rather than, and it's not even anti-immigration, it's just have some reasonable... Mm -hmm. moderation in immigration. You know, if I have one beer, that's fine. If I have three beers, I'm a little dizzy. If I have 30 beers, I'm dead. You know, the moderation <laughs> is, is important. In the, there is an Aristotelian mean in these things that... that, that so I think that the left-wing uh, politicians are concerned there's going to be a swing to the right. And so there are um, a, a number of things that I've looked into where there's supposed to be these attacks on migrants. And uh, when you start brushing away the propaganda, uh, a lot of these stories do seem to be rather flimsy, to put it mildly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. Uh, they were so scared. Uh, was it six months ago, something like that? There had been some fires at the asylum houses. And um, so they decided that all the addresses of the asylum houses would be kept a secret because there were these raging racist Swedish guys running around putting uh, these houses to fire. Now, um, a few months ago, it was um, released from the police that most of these fires are lit by the asylum seekers themselves. The only cases where I think that Swedes have put these houses on fire is when you suddenly find that in your village, in the old school, which is which have been closed for some years because there are not enough children in this village anymore, suddenly is going to be an asylum house. And you know that the whole village will be turn upside down, you will be so scared, you, will, you won't be able to send out your kids in the street anymore to play, uh, and suddenly there is a fire, and the school is getting burned down to the ground, and so there can be no asylum house in that particular building anyway. That is, I believe, Swedes, who have come to the conclusion that it doesn't matter what I say. It doesn't matter how many politicians I phone and say, please don't do this. I fear for my children, for my wife, for my everything. That will not help you. Uh, so what can you do if you really know that this will turn my world upside down? You can put your, there, there are no people inside the building. No one will get hurt. No one will get killed. But they can't use this place as an asylum house. I can understand it. I don't really, you know, I don't applaud people who do that. I think it's a criminal act and you shouldn't put things into fire. But I can certainly understand why they do it. Well, I guess the view is that it's more prevention than cure. And uh, that has its advantages. So let's, let's finish off. And I, I hope we get a chance to chat again because I, I really do want people to, to understand this challenge, this problem. I believe that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sort of of the never say die mentality. It's never too late until it's clearly too late. And I don't think that is the case as yet. But without information, um, history without intervention, without knowledge, it's just like a series of dominoes. And you know when the last domino is going to fall by looking at the first one. But we do yeah. have choice and we do have free will. So Ingrid, what would you like most to say 
uh, to uh, people who are listening to this about what needs to be understood. What needs to be done to me is it's premature because everybody wants to say, well, what do we do? What do we do? Well, the first thing we need to do is trust that when people have the right information, they will make the right decisions. And there are huge numbers of people with heavily invested powers in, in politics and, and media and entertainment and, and uh, journalism who have a vested interest for whatever psychosis we can't fathom and who cares, they have a vested interest in keeping basic facts from people. I trust intelligent people when given the right information to make good decisions. So what we do, it doesn't matter. But the first thing we all need to do is get on the right page with the right facts about what is actually happening. Then and only then can we start to discuss what might need to be done. That's sort of my particular perception, which is why I work hard mm -hmm. to get this information out. But what is it that you would like most people to know? And if you have thoughts about what to do, I'm happy to have that broadcast mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, but I I agree with you. I think that, uh, first of all, you must think like Churchill, never give up, never give in. It's never too late. And I really believe that. I just say uh, that on a bad day, I can be, you know, sort of a, oh, how can we save Sweden? But I know if there is the will, there is the force. So first of all, talk to your friends, talk to your family, talk to your colleagues, to, Ask them, how do you feel? I feel scared. How do you feel not being able to walk, you know, your, the streets of your hometown? How about your children, your old parents and so on? Start talking to people. You will find out. They will not, probably not, look at you and point finger and yell racist. They will say, well, you know, I'm really worried too. That's the first step. Start talking. And then when you have started talking, you start to find out facts. And you build networks, you, you listen to um, YouTube videos, podcasts, you read the alternative media, you, there's a whole world out there. You will, once you open your eyes, you will become so knowledgeable in just a few weeks. And first you will get really depressed because you will, you will think, well, it's too late. It's gone too far. It's too late. But then you will find a new power again. Again, talk to your friends, talk to your colleagues, talk to your family and decide that it's never too late. I mean, we could we could make laws if we want to. We could make laws to say Islam is forbidden in Sweden. There will be no more mosques and we will tear down the mosques because we decided that this is a fascist, a, a totalitarian ideology that is the most despicable one that human being has ever uh, come up with. So there will be no more Islam in Sweden. If you want to be a Muslim, you, we won't, uh, you know, raid your house and see if you have a prayer rug or something like that. But you will not be able. And it's forbidden to walk around in pyjama and hijab. We can do all those things. You just think we can't do it because we have had politicians for so many years saying, wow, that would be racist and xenophobic. We have freedom of religion in this country. Well, you know, freedom of religion is that people can pray to whatever God they want in their own house. That is freedom of religion. But we don't want people who come in and tell us that your democracy sucks, Islam is a much better system, and uh, wave goodbye to democracy and uh, rights for women and human rights and all the other stuff. We can make whatever law we want to if we just get into power, if we just are so many that we will force the politicians, the crooked politicians to get away from the government and we put better politicians in there and then we can do whatever we want. I mean, Spain did it in the um, 1400s. They got rid of all the Muslims and we can do it if we just want to. We can do it. Yeah, historically, there's a strong argument um, to be made that the alternative to containment is either subjugation or war. And uh, it is, of course, uh, we are still in the phase where things can be uh, um, resolved peacefully, relatively peacefully. And that is where, because the alternative, if the conversation is squashed down, if the conversation is ignored, if everybody just screams verbal abuse at those who have legitimate concerns and complaints, they're not solving the problem. They're escalating the problem because the problem is going to be resolved one way or the other. And it is my, of course, goal and hope that it is as peaceful uh, and as positive as possible and that maybe Europe can learn a little bit 
of something about not relying on the government to sustain culture, not relying on the government for things like charity, not relying on the government to, to, to solve all the problems in society. Because one of the reasons why Europe has ended up is, is a couple of generations, there's been massive reliance on government. Private charities have fallen away. The welfare state has taken over. Well, if there was no welfare state, there would mm -hmm. be no incursions because they're coming for the welfare state. You, some guy from Afghanistan who doesn't speak Swedish and has barely got any education how would he fare moving to Sweden if it was a truly free market environment? He wouldn't do well at all. So the welfare no, no. state is the giant pot of honey that is bringing the predators. And maybe there's a lesson to be learned for Europe, not just about the dangers of Islam, but also the dangers of the welfare state and relying so much on the government to solve every social problem that it becomes a, a, a ripe carcass ready for the picking. Yeah, just look at Sweden. I mean, um, we have the Viking blood running through our veins, and what are we doing? We're just sitting, you know, on our butts saying, well, 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 well someone's got to do something about it. Someone in the government must fix this. So the welfare state has actually made Swedes docile in just a few generations. And I think that is, that is actually something we can learn from it. And I know the Swedes still love the welfare state. I'm sort of... Um, Quite the addict loves his drug. That. that doesn't mean the drug is good yeah. for him. No, no, I know, I know. So, but I think that we will, we will come out of this um, horrible experience um, smarter and better educated of taking care of ourselves. And I think we have to go back to the old uh, ways, you know, taking care of each other, not not leaving everything to to the state. I mean, um, educate your children at home. Uh, take care of your mother and father and help each other. Ha have daycares, you know, in your community. Don't listen. Don't do. let the state do everything. And I think that the Swedish people will be much better than they have been for many generations when we come out of this horrible ordeal. All right. Well, very, very wisely spoken. And uh, I really, really appreciate your time today and naturally of course I hugely appreciate the amount of work that you're doing to to bring this information out for those who don't know it is particularly challenging uh, in Europe uh, to, to be able to do this so I appreciate your courage in uh, all of this we'll put a link uh, to your articles below uh, people you know forego uh, your next meal and spend time reading Ingrid's work uh, we'll put uh, the Gatestone uh, Gatestone institute.org is where you can find the, the Gaystone Institute. We'll put links to your articles below. Uh, Ingrid, of course, thank you so much, and uh, I hope we can talk again. Thank you so much, Devon. I'm, I'm really happy to be here, and I hope we can talk again soon.